hustlers, road players, tournament champions. Hear the stories, get their advice, learn about their lives. Our host, Joey Ryan, brings you an inside look at the professional pool player. You're listening to the Pool Player Podcast, brought to you by Pool Scene 365. Hey guys, Joey Ryan here for another episode of Pool Player Podcast. Thank you guys for joining. I'm really excited about today's episode, but before I jump in, I just want to give a shout out to the latest latest Patreon supporter. It's Tanner Pruce. Guys, if you want to catch these uh, episodes live and uncut, then join the Patreon. I'll put you in a private Facebook group. They're seeing this right now. They're able to see this interview as it's taking place. Uh, and you guys can get that extra added benefit. Uh, if not, still happy to have you on YouTube. Happy to have you have as, as a subscriber. So please hit that subscribe button and uh, you'll catch these interviews about a week after they happen once I get done with editing. So we have a great episode for you today. Uh, really good pool player out of Canada who's actually uh, pretty recently won the Swanee out in California, and he's had a number of big wins out in uh, Canada. And I want to hear a little more from him because I understand that he's got some training and some other things going on. And so without further ado, let me bring in Eric Horlifson. Hey, got Eric. It. Good pronunciation. I, oh, yeah, so I, hey, I want, hey, I want to know, like, how many people get your last name right on the first oh, shot? No, never, never. I mean, we're, we're not going to say that I helped you a little bit, but you, who knows? Maybe you would have. But uh, yeah, it's the J messes everyone up, right? Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, a couple of things I'm surprised about is one that you remembered the last time we played because you beat me nine to nothing in about, I don't know, 15 minutes. That was and a weird match. <laughs> weird, definitely. And, and two is that you're not wearing a Yankee hat. I'm used to seeing you in your Yankee That's hat. That's right. I, well, it's in, it's in my apartment here, but I, I'm still a Yankees fan. But of, of yeah. course, Blue Jays too. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, I want to I want to learn more about you. Uh, you know, I've seen you probably for the last 15 years when I would go to Valley Forge, maybe 20 years uh, mm -hmm. on the, the gambling tables there and different events there. And, you know, just saw your name around a lot. And then we got the chance to meet out in Phoenix uh, not too long ago. But I want to yeah. learn more about your background and what got you started playing pool. Sure. So um, I started at a really young age. I started at like five years old. Uh, I had a snooker table in my basement. And, you know, Playing at that young of an age, didn't really know much about it, but I played a lot. I always enjoyed the game from the beginning. And when I was about 10, my dad's work uh, moved on top of I'm – I'm originally from Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is like north of Minnesota. And uh, my dad's work moved on top of pretty much the biggest action room in Winnipeg. And he came home one day, and he was like, yeah, they have tournaments at this pool room. And, you know, this is before social media. and all you know generally the world being connected more and i said well what's that and he goes well it's you know you, you can go and play in a tournament so pretty much as soon as i heard that i was like okay well let's go my dad had played recreationally his whole life and um he started getting into it more when he became exposed to the game a little more through this pool room as well and yeah it just kind of went from there and i i played a lot of tournaments and just generally got exposed to the game more from about 10. I won my first tournament when I was probably 10 and a half and kind of went from there. When you started playing pool, was there something like a lot of times I'll talk to pro players and there's something that kind of really attracted them to the game, the clang of the balls or, you know, the geometry behind it. What attracted you to the game from the beginning? I think I think to me it's it, it's about it's it's a singular sport. You have you have total control of what you're doing yourself. Um, just the control factor I like too. You know, like being able to pocket balls for thirty minutes at a time and getting on big runs, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So what what's your favorite game to play, Art? I still like nine ball. You know, it's probably a weird answer from a pro player. But uh, I think it suits my game more. I, I play more of a kind of a freewheeling style. Um, I feel like I get beat on the break a little bit more in 10 ball. Admittedly, 10 ball is a better game, you know. 
Um, there's there's more moves. There's more kicking. But I feel like nine ball suits my style more, and I, I'm still I'm still attracted to it. I'm happy to see Matchroom running more nine ball tournaments because I feel like I have a chance now. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just kidding. But um, you know. If 10 ball was the biggest game, I'm sure I'd play more of it, but I, I enjoy playing nine ball more. I feel like it's more rewarding in a lot of ways. Like when you play safe in nine ball, you're usually rewarded more. You know, 10 ball to me is like you play a safe and it's really easy to get a, a kick safe off, uh, off in, in return. And I feel like um, big breakers have like a real, uh, have so much more of an advantage in 10 ball compared to nine ball. Again, yeah. Ten ball, it, I, I believe, is a better game, but yeah, nine ball is my favorite. I've played a fair bit of eight ball as well. You no, know, I, I guess I started seeing you. You, you don't know. I mean, we probably played a few games together at Valley Forge, you know, on the ten, twenty dollar tables or something. Um, but I guess you were in your early twenties or somewhere around there. Was there mm -hmm. a moment when you maybe won a big ab event or? you know, did really kind of outperformed what you thought you would do where, you know, you kind of thought, Hey, I've, I can play with anybody. I've arrived. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like I got like, this is way before Fargo. Right. But I feel like I got to around maybe like a 700 Fargo by the time I was like 14 or 15. So I was always like an above average player. Um, but I came second in, uh, in a tournament in Winnipeg when I was 15, all the best players in the city were playing in it. And that was that. That was a good boost to me. When I was 19, I actually won a a tournament with all the best players in Canada. It was it was about I think it was like 12,000 first prize, and I was like an underdog in that tournament for sure. Um, Alex Pagulian was there. Corey was there. He was at a casino in a province called S S S Saskatchewan. Um, but yeah, that was a big boost to me as well. Like in in my early career. And from the, I, I never really played full time until I was about 23 in my early 20s. And I made that decision in my early 20s that I would start playing full time. And things just kind of went from there. $12,000. That's a lot of money to make in a pool tournament. <laughs> back then. Back then. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it was, uh, it was one of, one of the biggest tournaments in Canada at the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, would you believe that I've been to Saskatchewan? Really? What, yeah. what what city do you remember? There's not Ask, even Yeah, two uh, I, 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 yeah. well, I went to so for my day job I sell software and okay. my comp my company was acquired and they didn't know what to do with me because they had the whole United States covered but they didn't have any business in Canada. So they said, "Hey, you take Canada this, this year and see what we can do." And sure. I sold, I sold $0 in software that year. <laughs> <laughs> but wow. I did know a lot of great Canadians and uh I spent some time in Toronto. I spent some time mm -hmm. in in Vancouver. And, uh, I did a trip where I went and visited a friend of mine that I actually met professionally who lived in Regina. Did I pronounce that yeah. right? Yeah. It's a capital. Yeah. Yeah. And then we went up to Saskatoon and then we also went to a place called Moose Jaw. I don't know if you've yeah. heard of that. It's yeah. It's like the third biggest city. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we had a good time up there and it was kind of neat. He showed me uh, a man-made ski slope up there in Saskatchewan. I didn't know those cool. existed, but yeah, it was hmm. kind of neat. So when did you move to Toronto? I was about 23. So yeah. I, came, I came out here. Uh, I played in the, in the border battle. Do you remember that tournament? I don't. What was that? So it, it ran about four or five times. It ran about four years consecutively. Uh, it was um, a team of four Canadians against a team of four Americans. Huh. And it ran um, about four years consecutively in the early 2000s. And I was picked for the team. I don't know, call it around 2003, four. And that was the first time I, I'd ever come to Toronto. And um, just seeing the scene out here compared to what it was in Winnipeg. I mean, Winnipeg was actually a really great pool town too. We had we had about 20 pool rooms in, this, in, in the city, believe it or not. And it's only a city of like 750,000. But when I came out here, uh, what I first saw was like weekly tournaments of 250 first prize there was like eight of them you, you could take your pick on some days and you know some of them were even like three or four hundred first prize right and yeah. just seeing that as a young kid I, I i always said to myself like i hadn't moved to toronto at the time when i cut when i came for the border battle but when i saw that i was like well if i'm gonna do this and and still live in canada this is where i'm gonna be right 
So I went back home for about a year and, um, and then I came out here after that. Are you saying that Toronto is a place to live if you're going to be a professional pool player in Canada? What about like Vancouver or anything out that way? Not really. BC is a weird province because, um, I don't, I don't know if this is a hundred percent true to this day, but back in the day they, they actually didn't allow liquor in the pool rooms. So there was very few pool rooms out there. There's actually a, a fair bit of good players from BC, but there's just not many rooms. Uh, mm-hmm. It seems like they're, I, I, I noticed recently they're having some tournaments out there and there are rooms, but I would say Toronto's the best, Montreal's second best, Calgary's third best. Take us through your, uh, if you could go through your career, what would you say has been your greatest pool achievement? Um, I came second in the Turning Stone. I made the quarterfinals of the World Eight Ball Championships once. I've I've comp- I've gone overseas more than ten times, maybe closer to fifteen. I haven't, you know, I haven't really finished high that many times. It's it's super tough over there. Um, really, just a lot a, a lot of wins in Canada, mostly. You know, the 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 Swanson was a nice win for me. I've finished near the end of the U.S. Open a few times. Yeah, I noticed that when I uh, was looking up your profile that there was a, I guess, a tour called the Canadian 20K Tour, and mm-hmm. you you had quite a bit of success on that tour back in the day. Um, yeah, and there was a Stan James Nine Ball Tour. That that tour went across Canada. I won a couple of those. I, f- I finished in the final of two or three. So naming like second and turning stone and quarterfinals of the world eight ball. I mean, those are massive accomplishments. Uh, so through all of that, there had to be like a defeat that stands out and it's like, man, that defeat just crushed me. What mm-hmm. was your crushing defeat? I ask all the players that come on here this because, you know, I think back and while your nine to zero, you know, drubbing of me and Phoenix was pretty crushing. It, it doesn't even rank in the top 10 of most crushing defeats I've ever had. <laughs> sure. Um, when the, this is again a long time ago, but it's one that stands out in my mind when, when the IPT was running, um, I didn't get in on the, on the original hundred player invite list. Uh, but they ran, I don't know. I don't know if you remember this and I don't know if your viewers would remember this, but I'll, I'll just tell a quick story. There was, um, about, they, they, they ran things called tour card qualifiers. So they had about, for each event, they would qualify like 20 more players that weren't on the original 100 list. And I went to a tournament in uh, California to try and qualify, and I finished third out of 120 players, and there was two spots. Oh. To, and that was, to, that was to get like a tour card, right? And at that time, we believed that so you you remember generally about the IPT, like what it was and, you know, like they, they started off launching those $100,000 challenge matches, like more than that, $500,000 challenge matches, whatever it was, right? Yeah. And at that time, you know, the players believed that in in year one, there you know, there, was, there only ended up being two tournaments, but in year one, there was going to be five tournaments and last prize in every tournament was 5,000 and there was going to be 120 players off and on. Um, they, they were 120 player fields, but um, hundred, the same hundred players were invited to all of them. Um, plus the players that won the tour cards. Anyways, make a long story short. Um, half the players would have would have been invited back for the next year and what he was saying was in year two um there would have been 10 tournaments and last prize in each tournament would have been five thousand so basically you're on tour you're, you're guaranteed fifty thousand right a, a solid solid income yeah no kidding so yeah you know, and that, and that's last place, right? And and never mind. In those, in the, I don't know if people remember, but in, in those hundred player turn or in those hundred players that got on tour, about thirty of them were legends, about fifteen of them were unknown. So I was ex- I was expecting to make year two as well if I made year one, right? Yeah. So basically, I'm thinking I'm playing a I'm playing a set for a hundred thousand. That's what I thought in my mind. Right. Of course, it didn't end up being anywhere near that, but that's what I was thinking in my mind at the time. Uh, 
Oliver Ortman beat me. And Dennis Orcola won the winner's side. See, it was funny. There was a lot of there was a lot of great players that didn't how how you qualified for the IPT at the beginning was you just sent in a resume. And I sent in one. I, I didn't get in. But I remember even in the first tour card qualifier, um, Shane hadn't sent hadn't sent one in at all, and he won it. And mm -hmm. at, same with Alex, and Alex won the first tour card qualifier. I think they had about like four of the, uh, maybe three of these, but it was a big tournament, and you know it was like the the buzz was just so big at that time. There was so much money, um, and. Yeah, I was one spot away from getting in, right? So, <laughs> well, you know, the IPT, I, you know, because I'm a decent player, I have a lot of friends who had high hopes, you know, about sure. doing well in the IPT and what that could do for the sport. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, the IPT failed, uh, really. I mean, you could call it a failure, uh, I think, because it didn't last, uh, but right. it definitely re energized the sport. And I'm curious if you have any ideas for re-energizing the sport of pool nowadays. Well, I think it's just what Matchroom's doing, right? You know, I, I don't think it's a broken game. You know, all, all, the, all this talk about, you know, pool will never be big. It's not, it's not really about that to me. It's just about promoting it properly. And, and what Matchroom's doing, you know, it's not on live cable. And not that I'm a professional promoter, but I, I don't really feel like maybe necessarily... Um, live cable is the, the way to go in the future. You know, they, they're, they're hooked up with DAZN. They're hooked up with many streaming providers. Um, and really, to me, what the, the track that Matchroom's going on is, is promising to me. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be on board with everything they're doing. Have you played in a Matchroom event yet? Just the U.S. Open uh, last year. The, or the the last time they had it, I guess it was 2019. You know, I kind of would tend to agree about the future of pool cable television. I mean, I don't really watch cable only for a few sure. things. You know, mm -hmm. for me, it's all like watching stuff on the internet, YouTube, streaming, things like that, that I can watch on my own time. And so I, I think uh, the problem, though, I think that makes it a little tough is, you know, and, and you get this, right? There's a big tournament this weekend in Iowa. I'm not sure if you know about that. The big dogs yeah. have that yeah and uh ray hansen puts that on pool action tv he's going to be out there and you know i like helping to promote things like this and there's just certain people that are not going to pay 30 dollars to watch it over a weekend you know right. Mos moscone cup match room it's a huge bargain because you pay you know to you can pay and cancel you can get it and, and get rid of it but i'm curious your thoughts on the streaming aspect of pool uh you know in terms of free or paid per view I think it's a tricky one. I think it's something that, you know, these guys have to get paid somehow, right? So and until the industry steps up a little more and, or until they feel like it's valuable for them to um, be sponsoring events like this, they have to get paid somehow. But um, it, I, I guess it's better than nothing. You know what I mean? It, it, if they're able to make it free, obviously that's the best. But for now, I think it's it's something that's, they're putting in they're putting in the the legwork to build their audience and to build their brand and hopefully one day there'll be enough sponsorship that they can make it free and make a living for themselves as well, right? Yeah. And so I know you spent some time kind of out on the road before and mm -hmm. uh, you know matching out with people and getting in the grease a little bit. Uh, I'm curious if you have any stories you want to share about the road or anything like that period of time, maybe not even a particular story, but just like what that was like. Uh, because I think a lot of people are like, you know, they'll see somebody make five or six balls or run out of table and the, well, you should go on the road. You'll make a ton of money. It'll be great. Sure. <laughs> but tell us what it's really like. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've been out a few times. Like I, I, I've been out for tournaments where I would stay out for two weeks. I've done that. Uh, I don't know, more m multiple times, but the one time I went out for months at a time, um, it was kind of a, it was kind of just a, coincidental story but uh jason clatt and and me you know jason clatt right yeah actually uh i'm gonna have to show my face for this one because uh i'm undefeated against jason clatt he oh, snuck, wow. he snuck um, into the the uh amateur open at uh super billiards expo and i beat him one year so good for you that's <laughs> yeah. a good win 
Yeah, it is. I'll take it. Um, yeah, so him and I went down to the Derby City Classic, and then we were in like our, he's like four years younger than me. I was in my early 20s. And somehow we got hooked up with Chris Bartram, who's like a legend of the road, you know, super good guy. Didn't even know us. I think he might have known Jay uh, in passing. But basically, we, we left from there, and we never came home for like six months. And we wow. just followed everything that Chris did. It was it was a dream. I mean, like you know, for two young players, we, we were we were great players by that time. You know, we we're probably over seven twenty five Fargos, whatever, maybe even closer to seven fifty. We were we were good players, but if we had to do it on our own, who knows what would have happened, right? But we just followed all all the spots that he knew, and um, yeah, it was fun. It was good. <laughs> Who are you? Are, are there any players out there that you either really enjoy watching or kind of look up to? Uh, Shane's. I think for most most North American players, Shane is the like the role model. Uh, you know, I what when I teach a lot of the fundamentals I teach are relative to what he's doing. Uh, he's always been one of my favorite players, one a, a guy that I watch. Um, from from the Asian players, I like uh, Coping Chung. I like Alex Pagulayan for the Filipinos. Like he's, you know, Canadian actually, but as, as far as Filipino type style or Filipino type player, like I like Alex, um, you know, and, and now you've got this new generation of players like, like filler, Jason Shaw just never misses a ball. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I, I appreciate all players and I appreciate all styles and I, I try to dissect what the best players in the world do and, and, and kind of, roll that into my teaching as well. So you mentioned Alex, uh, obviously yourself, John Mora, Jason Clab. We've already talked a bunch of Canadian names on here. And mm -hmm. I'm curious because what if we had a border battle today? How do you think Canada would fare against the U.S.? It's, it's going to be close. Yeah, it, it would be close. I mean, we have we have eight player, around eight players in Canada over 750 Fargo. Um, the best player from out west is Stephen Holum. The best player from Quebec is Danny Hewitt. Danny Hewitt doesn't travel much, but it, he wins 80% of the tournaments in Quebec. Stephen Holm wins 80% of the tournaments in Alberta. Uh, Stephen's going to be traveling a lot. You know, he's the, he's the young up-and-coming kind of young gun type of player. He came to Toronto four months ago. He finished second in a tournament here. I, I, uh, I got in a doubles challenge match with him. I, liked how, I, I like how he played, you know, in – He's just, he knows how to win too, right? Like, I mean, he wins at a really high rate all the tournaments he plays. Yeah, there's there's certain players out there, right, that, you know, I don't know what it is, but they just, they can get the results, right? They mm -hmm. can be down in a match. And I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this because I remember one time I was talking with my good friend Mike Davis from the East Coast. Yeah. And you know, Jeremy Sasse was kind of traveling the East Coast, going up and down and playing in events. And I watched him play and I looked at him and I didn't see like anything flashy or anything like, wow, this guy's an amazing player. But yet he was just constantly getting there first, second, third, you know, always finishing in the money, always like challenge matches. He's grinding it out. And I, I said to Mike, I was like, well, you know, what's with, with this guy? And he's like, well, he breaks the balls real good. He said, but he just tries really hard. Sure. I kind of stuck with me because I thought about it and I was like, you know, sometimes I don't try really hard. Maybe that's all I need to do. But yeah. you know, have you noticed that about some players that there's this, those players that just have that extra kind of dig down deep and, and try harder? Yeah. And, and just the ability to avoid tilt too. Right. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's like, that's a big thing. Like a, it, to win a tournament, call it, call it a 64 player tournament. You got to win eight matches. Right. So you, you have to, there's going to be ups and downs over the course of the tournament. And, and there's just, I, I think there's players that there's some players that are good enough that they just avoid tilt naturally, right? Like they're, they're a level above the field and, you know, they're so good that it's hard for them to mess up almost, but that, that that's a rare, that, that that's not a common thing. Um, but, you know, I, I would put saucy in that, in that type of category where, he just, he never, his, his mental game is, is very strong. Like you never see him imploding in a match. Right. Yeah. Um, 
I, I try, I try to model myself after that too. And I, I feel like when I'm comfortable, I can, you know, I, I can get in spots where I'm, I'm, I'm pretty solid. Right. Yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about what you've been doing over the last year or so with training, because sure. You know, that's a, that's a hot topic right now. There's, I think with the pandemic, more and more people are putting information out online. It's almost like information overload coming out in all different places. And so yeah. how do people find folks like yourself that are really gifted teachers, you know, and have content out there that could help, or, you know, you could set up sessions with them. Tell us what you've been doing with your teaching. Sure. So uh, just, just briefly, Toronto has been the most locked down city in North America. It's, it's, it's been locked down for like 10, maybe even 12 of the last 16 months. Um, so I've, I've kind of shifted to teaching online a little more. It, it was a necessity that the, the forums just haven't been open. And it's something that I've always wanted to do. Uh, I've really been teaching, um, like teaching almost more than playing for the last 10 years and I've, I've built a fairly strong base around Toronto um, but I've always thought and wanted the opportunity to kind of teach all over the world right and you know and with technology now um, with today's technology that's possible right so basically um, for, for my online lessons you can get on any kind of um, streaming platform zoom uh, messen video, video messenger call, Google Duo. There's, you know, there's so many of them and you can put in your wireless headphones and it's like, I'm right at the table next to you. Um, I found, I found a, like, you know, the small fundamental things are a little bit tougher to convey. You're not right next to someone, but definitely like any kind of glaring fundamental flaws. Or, it's, it's not a problem. I mean, you, you can still see that online. And, um, yeah, I, I, have enjoyed it and uh, I look to continue to do it after, um, after things are fully open and, um, you can, if anyone's interested in it, you can contact my website at, uh, my first name and my last name. We will put, probably put it in the link description, uh, mm -hmm. for this podcast, uh, dot com, or you can message me on messenger and yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here for you guys. If you need any help let me uh i'll throw that up for them right now just so they see you said first name dot last name uh first name last name all one word dot okay. com okay yeah. one second we'll get that up for folks so they can see it eric with a k and the old h j o r leafson yeah dot com <laughs> yeah okay great yeah so you know i would encourage people to get in touch with you uh, so that they can kind of see and, and when they do, what should they expect that might be a little different than maybe some of the other instruction? Like, what do you bring to the table that is a little bit unique without giving away your secrets, of course? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think my strength is really in um, like gameplay, safes, real, real game situations. Um, I'm not, I'm not a real big, uh, you know, stickler on the fundamentals like of course i know what's right and wrong and if there's something you know if there's any fatal errors we're going to go over that and and it's definitely something we're going to we're going to address um but it's it's my belief that you know as long as you can repeat a stroke um consistently there's so many different strokes in the world like if you watch all the top players in the world there's so many different ways that players approach you know body build is going to play into that as well. So, you know, there, there's like five to 10 things that you look for that are really going to hurt a player in the long run. If, if they're not doing that fundamentally, you know, uh, along the same lines as the top players. But once we get over that, I, I focus more on just gameplay stuff, advanced breaking techniques, um, like cue ball manipulation stuff, really just things that, I think can move a player from around a, a 550 level to like closer to a 650 level, right? Like that's a big improvement. You know what I mean? But I, I, I feel, and really to, to improve that much, it's, it takes practice. Like that, that's just a reality, you know, like this game is so hard, right? So, you know, anyone that's looking to take a lesson, you can't think that, you know, there's, it's, you're going to get a little bit of advice and, and you're going to go up 
you know, like a hundred points right away. Right. It takes a lot of time too, but, um, yeah. Yeah. So along with that, you also are kind of active in some Facebook groups and things like that. Right. Do you want to tell people about those? Sure. So yeah, if you, if you want to get a, uh, an idea of, of what my teaching is like, you can, you can join my Facebook page, the champions club. Um, I have a bit of a presence on my, on my other Facebook page. We are, pool, we are pool players, uh, that I do with my friend, Greg Plester. And, uh, we also do a podcast. We are a pool players podcast. Uh, but if you want to see some samples of, of my teaching, uh, and, and my style, you can uh, you can join my my Facebook group, the Champions Club. The We Are Pool Players podcast. I'm really interested in talking about that. And sure. you know, one thing I found since I started doing this podcast, I've been doing it now for about eight or no ten months now. Wow, time flies. Mm-hmm. And uh, the thing that I've really been impressed with is just how kind of folks work together. You know, like you got yeah. Nate, Nate Mindham who does a podcast, and he's given me some advice, and I've you know, shared some stuff with him and, you know, yeah. yeah. And so like when I first, uh, like found out about we are pool players was the other day. And that's when I was like, Oh, I got to reach out to Eric. Let's get him on. And and you were awesome. Mm -hmm. You're like, yeah, I'm available tomorrow. Let's do it. You know, tomorrow, the next day, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I want to talk to you about that podcast because I found both you and Greg to be very articulate and it's a it's a shorter podcast. It's like thirty minutes usually, I think, and yeah. very current events oriented. And I love the fact that with like each one, it's kind of like you have a set, maybe four or five different topics that you're going to talk about that are timely and interesting. So you know, how did this whole thing start? Where did it come from? Yeah, well, it's it's kind of similar to the the fact that we we've been lo- like Greg is from about an hour outside of Toronto, but it's really the whole area of like call it a two hour radius that's been locked down for this long. So. Greg and I were pretty heavily into promoting the Champions Club and and really developing an online course that I was going to put out. And that will happen in the future. But with the pool rooms not being open, we came to a point where we're like, okay, well, we got, we got to do something, right? And we started doing the podcast. And, um, you know, I think, I think it flows really well. Greg's an excellent pr- presenter. He's also like around a, a 675 Fargo level player himself. So, he has, you know, good feel for what is going through players' minds, or just basic uh, the general feel of, um, you know, what the tournament scene is like. And uh, yeah, we we basically we're on about our twentieth podcast, I think, and uh, we're really happy with it. And we're, we're gonna we're gonna continue with it. Yeah, well, I certainly encourage my audience to check it out uh, because we're all in this together, right? I mean, at some point, it had to be in your guy's mind, hey, this would help promote the sport, right? Definitely, and that, yeah. You know, that's what I'm doing. You know, let's just try to promote the sport and get it out there. So I encourage everybody out there to check out We Are Pool Players podcast. And I think you guys will like it. It's it's pretty cool. What? Uh, yeah, well, I don't remember because I clicked on it. What's the actual uh, service where you can get to that? So that 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 is it. We are Pool Players Podcast Facebook page. Um, you okay. can, you're 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 welcome to join my. Uh, he he drops the episodes on We Are Pool Players as well. Um, you can I always uh, re- release them every week if you're well. Anyone's welcome to friend me and and check it out on there. But the the easiest way to get the notifications would be um, We Are Pool Players Podcast. Can we talk a little about? Because I remember, you know, I, I had followed you and, and seen you had some success at Turning Stone, you know, finishing second that one year. And, you know, you, that's one of those events I think you always played in because it was kind of close to Canada. Yeah. But then I know you were living, I guess, out in Vegas for a little while or staying out in Vegas and then mm-hmm. snapped off that Swanee. Can we talk about that tournament? Can you take us through that tournament? Because I know every tournament's different. You know, some you just blast right through it. Some you have. Sure. Your Tell us about it. Yeah, it was a it was a 120 player tournament at um, an old school pool room in San Diego, and yeah, I was down in Vegas for three months, and I was I was in a spot where I was playing every day. I was playing like I don't know six six to ten hours a day. It was the most I ever played in my life. It was actually a part of a uh, a venture that didn't end up um, coming to fruition, but uh, we were down there basically playing and testing patterns for something that was going to be an online gambling um, 
play, I guess you would call it. It's kind of a long story, but um, oh, is that Vinny? Was that Vinny? Was he involved? Yeah, the, the seven yeah. ball run stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, you yeah. know, I found that really interesting. We had him on the Booth Brothers and talked about like what he was trying to do, and you know, I think the concept is is really nice. I mean, yeah. No, I think it's great. Yeah. So yeah. we were just we, we were testing we were running patterns to to see what the actual uh, real life percentages would be of running those patterns. Basically, it, it, it's a it's a concept where seven balls are pre are pre positioned on a table, and you can bet whether the player will will run out or not. Um, the cue ball is even pre projected on the table, and um, some of the patterns are so tough that the the odds of running out were like one in five. So if you were to bet on the player to run out, you would get four and a half to one, four, four point seven five to one, whatever it would be. Um, or you could bet against them and you'd be getting around one to five. Um, yeah, it was, it was a good concept, but it just, it, it, something, something went wrong. It's a, it's a long story, but, um, yeah, we were down there and it was a lot of fun and we went out to the, uh, Swanson Memorial. It was a 128-player tournament. Mika was there. The best players were Mika, Oscar, um, most, of the, most of the top players from the West Coast. I feel like my draw was decent. I remember being stuck. It was a race to eight. I remember being stuck about um, like six nothing, I want to say. It was that bad against uh, Ernesto Dominguez in the final eight on the winner's side, and I beat him eight six. So wow. that was def yeah. So that was definitely like a, you know, a turning point in the tournament. Um, I think I beat Oscar in the winner's side final, and Manny Perez uh, made it to the final. Let me let me stop you right there, Eric, because you know these are the kind of things I like to try to dive into and get inside your head a little bit. So you're down six to nothing in your chair against Ernesto, mm -hmm. and I don't know what happens. Maybe let's say he scratches on the break. What are you thinking about? When you're down six nothing and he's racking to go up, you know, again, and yeah. then what, what are you thinking when you actually get out of the chair? Well, I'm just tr I'm I'm trying to stay as as level headed as possible, right? But I mean, really, the only way you can come back in, in those situations is is if you get lucky, number one, which you don't want to rely on, obviously, or if you're just if you're just playing good. And I like I knew I was playing good. I, it it's you know. It's all relative, right? And it's easier for like a top player to say stuff like this, but there becomes a point where the scoreline doesn't matter. You know, it's just a, it's just about getting chances, and about you know when when you get that chance, you know you're like ninety percent to run out. Like that that that's a you know that, that's a high level thing to say, right? But I think for all players, it's just like putting in enough practice that you believe in yourself. And if you don't believe in yourself, you're in big trouble when you're when you're stuck in a spot like that. You know what I mean? And that's and that's the kind of mind frame I was in in, in that tournament. And really, of course, I was bothered. You know, of course, I know when I'm down six nothing, I'm not the favorite, right? But it's like it just didn't really it didn't bother me as much as it would have if I wasn't playing much or if I wasn't confident. That's yeah. how I generally think, you know. Yeah, and that ninety percent thing whether it's true or not that you at that point in time, you can run out 90% of the racks. I know what you're talking about. Cause sometimes you feel that way. Right. And I'm not mm -hmm. the player that you are, but just sometimes I'm seeing the ball so well that I'm like, if I get to the table, I feel like I can run out pretty much anytime I get to the table. So I've had matches where I'm down seven to two, you know, six to three. And I'm like, Oh, I need a shot and I'm back in it, you know? Sure. And, it, and it's all different levels. Like even, you know, even if you're a league player and, and you, you can only run 25% of the racks, it's, it's more like you're, you're probably in a situation where your opponent can probably only run 25% of the racks too. Right. So it's more believing that when you get the chance to win the game, you're you're gonna you're gonna win the game a, a big percentage of the time, right? It's all it's all different levels of that kind of thinking, I think. Yeah, I, I think I, I might have got you off track there from the Swanee. So you you beat Ernesto. I think you said you beat Oscar later in the tournament. Mm hmm Yeah. He and, finished uh, third and, and and Manny Perez uh was in the final actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And how did the final go? Was it you know, I just I think I won around nine three. Can't remember oh. the exact score. Yeah. So you, you were in gear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Uh, would you say that's your biggest win? I've had a lot of big, uh, big, big wins in Canada. 
the Turning Stone one was big for me. You know, I beat Copini in that tournament. Um, I feel like every time I go out to a major tournament, I beat two or three good players. It's just to win the tournament, you have to beat seven or eight good players. You know what I mean? Like like majors, right? Um, right. You know, I've I've I, I've always done well, I'm just not quite at the top. That's why it might not be quite as you know a, a household face or, or for especially American players, you know. But um, yeah, I mean yeah. that's one of the reasons I wanted to get you on here because uh, you know I saw firsthand how well you played. <laughs> When you mm-hmm. joined me, and uh, and that was on a super tight table. I don't know if you remember that table in Phoenix, but we have some tight tables. I th- in fact, I think that might have been Scott Frost's table that he won at Derby City. That's been tightened up even tighter. Really? Yeah. You didn't miss a ball. I mean, you played perfect. And so when I thought about you and I saw the podcast, I was like, well, let's get him on here so more folks in America can find out about you and some of the stuff that you're doing. And so along those lines. I'm I'm always curious, like what pool players do when they're not playing pool. Do you have any other hobbies or interests or? Well, what- I, I generally like sports. You know, um, I spend time with my with my girlfriend. Nothing special. I, I I'm generally a sports nut. I really like baseball. Um, you know, I, I all Canadians like hockey. We 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 watch hockey up here. Um. Yeah, not, not, nothing super interesting, you know, like out of the ordinary. Yeah, you're not like a ch- professional cello player or something? <laughs> not really, no, not really. Do you have, uh, have you ever used any other resources in pool, like books or, you know, any type of self-help books or mental game type of stuff, anything like that? Mm, not particularly on, along those lines. Like, uh, I just feel like for whatever reason, my mind isn't quite as receptive to uh, receptive to it as it should be i i think you know it's something i should look into more because i there's definitely spots where i feel like mentally i'm i I could be in a stronger spot to me all that stuff is just about being comfortable though and and to me like i i kind of just watch i watch pool i I watch matches that's that's how that that's the the work i do outside of what i like particularly working on my own game Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, I think the CSI events, the pro series that are going around and I signed up for the one in Tucson. It's right near my house. Why not? And so I'm on like a two week training regimen where Mm -hmm. I'm going to get ready for that tournament. I have a eight foot diamond here at the house. It's tightened up a little bit. And so I'm trying to be disciplined and come up with a plan to prepare. And I always love asking top players, like if if let's say Toronto opens back up completely tomorrow and you know, a big pool promoter there is like, Oh, I'm tired of this. We're doing, you know, $20,000 added. We're going to sure. do it. In, we're going to do it in one month and all the best players in the world are going to come and you're going to be there. What are you doing to prepare? Take us through your regimen. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that we are, we are opening fully for the first time in four months on Friday. So nice. Yeah. So I already got like three small tournaments planned and I'm going to be teaching live again. And wow, it's just, you know, it's been a long time. It's it's, it's not fun. It, thing, things are open here, just not the pool rooms. But um, when, when I'm preparing for tournaments, I try to mimic what the tournament situation or what the tournament conditions are going to be like. So if it's a 10 ball tournament, I'm going to play 10 ball. If it's a nine ball tournament. I'm going to play nine ball. We're playing on nine foot, so I'm going to play on a nine foot. I even go as far as saying, um, if it's going to be on diamonds, I want to play on a diamond. You know, if it's going to be on a different brand of table, I'm going to play on that table. Um, even like, if if you can, going really far and like using the same balls, right? It's hmm. never going to be the exact same. And and the trickiest part about that one is that if it's a major tournament, it's going to be on new cloth, and it's it's hard to find new cloth sometimes. But uh, other than that, it's like, you know, just really getting into what are the breaking rules of the tournament? Like, are they using magic racks? Is it rack your own? Uh, is the nine on the spot? Is the one on the spot? And I just try to get down all those conditions, and that's what I'll practice. And from there, it's pretty simple. Like, I just try and break and run racks. I know it sounds it sounds like like a simple statement, but. I'll try to break and run racks under those conditions. Cause I really believe like for top players, that's, that's what makes the difference. 
you know, like being able to lock players out. And anytime you, um, the other player gets to the table, anything can happen, right? So, and it's like being offensive enough that, you know, you go on those two and three game streaks of, of just like not, like you can't lose those games, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because when I talk to pros and I ask them about preparing for a tournament, I have heard that in terms of simulating conditions before, Mm -hmm. uh, that's a consistent theme, but really a consistent theme is, is working on their break, you know, and it kind of shows how important the break is. So I'm kind of curious, just, you know, is it something that you'll do for an hour a day or do you do it until you got it locked in and then you're like, okay, I'm good now just a few times a day. Well, I think that's what goes along with the breaking and running stuff because, like, if you don't get a shot, then you just break again. Yeah. That, that, like, that's the way I do it, right? So it's like, you know, I, if I go out in a day and I'm trying to break and run, like, 40 racks, I probably have to break 100 times or more. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. hopefully it's only 100. I'm just kidding. But, no, um, you, I'm, I'm practicing my break in, like, in conjunction with, like, how, how what my practice regimen is kind of, right? And, yeah. you know, like five days leading up to the tournament, make sure your sleeping is normal, right? You know, like if if the tournament's going to start at nine in the morning and and for and you tend to wake up at 11 in the morning or or even early, like just, you know, wake up at the proper times. Can, yeah. we, can, we, can we just agree that pool tournaments should never start at nine in the morning? Can we just? <laughs> they, yeah, <laughs> they, they do, though. <laughs> you know? oh, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> what about nutrition does that factor in at all or do you just kind of grab what you can to eat? uh for me like on on tournament days I'll, I'll eat real big in the morning like overeat almost but you know making sure that i have at least two hours until i play and then i won't really eat. like say say it starts at 10 in the morning for example i'll get up have a real big breakfast and uh and then i probably won't eat again until like five o'clock and then just eating really light during during the whole tournament, never eating anything heavy unless you unless for some reason you know you have like a three hour break, then maybe you could get a bigger meal in. But that's that kind of goes along the lines of why I'm eating a big breakfast because I want to be full until I have to eat again. You know? Yeah. I I'd like to talk to you a little bit about sponsorship and pool and. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I was kind of surprised to find out that you don't have sponsors, a player of your caliber. So um, tell us your views on sponsorship and pool and kind of, you know, maybe why you don't have a sponsor. I think it, I think it's a little bit tougher up in Canada. You know, the, the game's big up here, but I, I'd say it's not quite as big as the U.S. Um, I'm, I'm in a big city. The, the, it, the game is actually very big in Toronto, but uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of places where it's just, there's not as many people. It's not as big. Um, I think a lot of the sponsorship stuff goes along the lines of th- the players need to be visible. And, you know, the, and that's where we're kind of doubling back on that paid stream stuff. At least the players are visible on those streams, right? Um, I feel like the players are going to become way more visible with, with Matchroom stuff. And even, like, getting to – that that's another thing that Matchroom's doing is, like, they're getting to know the players. There's, there's pre-match interviews, there's post-match interviews, the players are in the box commentating, right? So those are things that I think for a long time that sponsors just needed to see. They needed to see value in, in who they were getting behind. But the the trend that I see the game going in now, I feel like sponsors will be able to see that value from top players, right? And and just generally, I, I feel like the game is growing, right? So if if um, if, if sponsors are are making more money, they're, they're going to put more money back into the game. You can see what Predators done in the last year, yeah. right? You know, so stuff like that. I feel like it's going to be easier for for players to get more backing. But I also feel like you know it's important. It's it's important for a player like me. You know, like there's there's times when I pass on tournaments because it just doesn't make sense financially to, to put my own money in or even a staker's money in or, or however to get there. Right. Um, you know, I'm never going to miss the U S open, but there are times like mid-level events where it's just like, like if, for example, the Midwest billiards expo, right. And, and nothing against it, you know, there's, there's money to be won there, but it's, it's a tough one. Right. Yeah. 
actually, I just saw on Facebook today, <clears throat> excuse me, that Dennis Hatch posted, uh, somebody posted the payouts from, uh, for the U.S. Open this year. Mm -hmm. And he was basically saying, I think you had to be top 16 to even start to try to make money. because If you're not on sponsorship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Travel. So, I mean, this one's prestigious enough that I'm not really worried about the money, right? But there, but there are times when, yeah, like, you know, you're talking about a third of that prize money or even less, like an eighth of that prize money. And, and it's just, it's, it's tough, right? Well, I think but yeah, I'm 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 here for any sponsors that uh you know want to get behind a player that <laughs> that um has a real big presence in in Toronto and um has a good online presence with um my Facebook groups now and uh yeah I'm here for you guys if you if uh you're interested I'm gonna be I'm gonna be competing more too right like more um outside of Toronto yeah. I'm 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 gonna play in the in the two U.S. Pro Billiard Series. There's one in uh, Ohio and there's one in Michigan. I'm going to the U.S. Open in September. Ah, come down to Tucson. Come on. Yeah. Well, that well, this is what I'm talking about with the with uh, you know the yeah. versus reward stuff, right? Yeah, you can crash with me, man. I got a room. Well, yeah, that's a start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I think I think what you said is correct, right? With what Matchroom has been doing with the interviews in between. Um, and not just that platforms like this and like what you and Greg are doing Definitely. and what Nate's doing. I mean, it's really giving the game more exposure. And I actually had a company reach out to me yesterday and say, Hey, I love your content and I want to start talking about a potential sponsorship. And I was like, that's really cool because it wasn't right. a poor company. It had nothing to do oh, with wow. it. Yeah. And so I'm like, wait a minute, people are starting to see. And whether I get that sponsorship or not, who knows? You'll find out in a couple of weeks, right? Um, but whether I get it or not is kind of not the point. The point is people are starting to see that we're getting the game out to other people. And someone like my wife who watches the Moscone Cup and she kind of doesn't love pool. And in fact, she's a little bitter about it because I spent a lot of time playing it. Mm -hmm. uh, when she watches the Moscone Cup and they do the interviews and they talk to the players and you get to know them a little bit and you have professional commentators and you have the production that Matchroom does, she's like, I love this. I could watch this every day. So she sure. can't wait for December to come to check it out. So I think we're all in this together. And, you know, by, by building this, um, kind of taking this sport and giving it more exposure, you know, I think it's really helping. Uh, I'm curious if you have, uh, you know, like we mentioned, there's a lot of players in the United States that might not know you. Um, are there, is there anybody out there that you would look at and say, hey, this would be a good challenge match for me? Uh, I'm not asking you really to call somebody out, but I'm just yeah. curious, like who you would look at and say, maybe I'd have to play my best to beat them or, you know. S someone like that. Yeah, I, th I think guys just around the 750 Fargo level, right? Like, like you know, guys like Robinson, Olson, Jeremy. I, you know, and I, if if I get a, in with an 800 level player playing 10 ball, I'm in tough. You know, I'll I'll be the first to admit it, right? So I don't, you know, I think it's it's more of um. I played Oscar a few times. He he beat me every time. Um. But he's kind of he's kind of like the upper echelon of players that I, I'd like to challenge. Um, you know, just guys like Brandon Schuff, kind of mid level pros, right? Yeah, I think a few of those names you mentioned would be really intriguing. I think, like, uh, I actually commentated the Chris Robinson Danny Olson match when they played mm -hmm. ten ball, and uh, Danny was just dominant in that match. I mean, he broke great, he played great. It was really fun to watch yeah enough. i feel like he's moved up a level in the, in the last six months to a year yeah you know i i'd like to see you play somebody like mitch ellerman sure yeah he'd be a good game too and we never we never played um when i was in vegas and mitch was in vegas at the same time too i just yeah. i didn't really have any staking when i was down there and i wasn't really down there long for long enough um to make something happen but you know that that'd be a good game yeah yeah. Well, Eric, I've really enjoyed our time together today and I, I wanted to kind of see, do you have any uh, final thoughts? Maybe tell people about your, your coaching one more time, how to get in touch with you and anything that you want to share with the audience. Sure. Well, I, I've just, um, 
the, the online stuff, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to help any of you out. Uh, I really enjoy teaching. It's, it's never going to be like, you know, a pushy type situation or anything like that. I never go into a lesson saying, oh, geez, I have to teach right now. I actually enjoy it. So anyone that's interested in um, um, getting in or contacting me, you can contact me on my website. Uh, I think we have it on the screen now. My first name and last name at um, dot com. And you, you can contact me on Facebook Messenger if you want. And yeah, I hope to hear from you. Awesome. And don't forget to check out the We Are Pool Players podcast uh, that you can reach out to Eric and he'll get you hooked up with that as well. Definitely. So Eric, I, I thank you so much for being here. Okay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, there you have it. That was Eric Horlison. Uh, I guess the J is silent. Actually, you told me there's a, a way that technically... I wasn't correct. It was close, but uh, I thought I did pretty good. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I really got to, uh, I really enjoyed getting to know him a little bit better. Again, the the one time, well, we actually played one time in, in Valley Forge at, late at night, I think a race to five or something, but then we played in Phoenix and he just destroyed me nine to nothing. Great player. He was split in the pockets of this super tight diamond that we were playing on. Um, so I wanted to have him on. Uh, he's doing a lot of stuff with the podcast. He's doing a lot of stuff with coaching and teaching, and I wanted you guys to get to know him. So again, thanks so much for your support. Uh, please go like, comment, share, subscribe. And if you would consider supporting me on my Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash pool player podcast. Thanks guys. Take care.